there, everybody. I see that it's just uh, just past 12.10, and I'm really excited to get started. So I'm just going to launch, uh, launch the seminar now. So uh, welcome to the fifth lecture in this year's Dalhousie Health Law Institute Health Law and Policy Seminar Series. We're online today, but Dalhousie is an I am in Mi'kma'ki, the ancient and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. We pay respect to the indigenous knowledges held by Mi'kmaq people and the wisdom of their elders past and present. We pay respect too to the histories, contributions and legacies of African Nova Scotians who've been in this territory for 400 years. I'm the Associate Director of the Health Law Institute, Sheila Wildman. I'm also co-chair of an organization called East Coast Prison Justice Society. And I wouldn't typically add that uh, to these introductions, but the work of today's guest, her broad work over uh, many years, surfaces hidden connections between disability and prison justice, deinstitutionalization and prison abolition, and exposes to the ways that ableism works alongside racism, poverty, and other bases of oppression to construct and reinforce systems of institutionalization and incarceration. Our much anticipated speaker today is of course, internationally renowned scholar, Liet ben Mache. Professor Ben Mache holds a PhD in sociology from Syracuse University with concentrations in women and gender studies and disability studies. She joins us from the University of Illinois at Chicago, where she is assistant professor of criminology, law and justice. Liet is the author of the 2020 book, Decarcerating Disability, subtitled Deinstitutionalization and Prison Abolition. Uh, I have that book right here, but you can also see the wild sort of background uh, behind Leah. She's also co-editor of the groundbreaking 2014 collection, Disability Incarcerated, Imprisonment and Disability in the United States and Canada. And if you do not have those two books, I strongly recommend to you to go out and get them. Uh, do it online <laughs> while you're listening. Uh, we are very lucky to have Professor Ben Mache with us at a time when advocates and government in Nova Scotia are asking in the context of live human rights litigation, what it might mean to remedy ongoing systemic discrimination against persons with disabilities, who for decades, instead of supports for social inclusion, have been subjected to the unacceptable alternatives of institutionalization or social abandonment. Getting that remedy right, requires that we be alive to the work of critical intersectional disability scholars like Professor Ben Mache. With that, Liet, I turn it over to you. Oh, one last thing. If along the way, all you folks online have questions, things you wanna share, there's a button called Q&A at the bottom and you can type in your question uh, there and we will be fielding those questions uh, at the end of uh, Liet's remarks. Thanks so much, over to you. Thank you so much, um, Sheila, and thanks for everybody for um, who invited me, um, Sheila and Ashley, and everybody who um, is a part of the seminar series. Uh, and uh, also thanks for everyone who's doing this kind of work that I'm going to talk about uh, today. Um, I am um, Liat, and I'm um, in Chicago, and. Uh, I put in the chat, but Chicago is on the traditional territories of the three fire people, the Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi. For people who are uh, on their phone or are going to see the recording um, and for whom it's helpful, um, a bit of an image description. I'm a um, semi-middle-aged, um, gray hair, short, very short hair, um, white uh, femme person wearing makeup and glasses, and um, you can't really see it, I don't think, but I'm a wheelchair user. I'm wearing um, added um, uh, sweater. And behind me is the back, the background behind me is the uh, image of my book, which is concentric circles that are kind of erupting uh, on the side. 
um, which is an abstract image that I think represents um, some of the things we're going to talk about today. So I'm going to um, share my screen in just a second to set up. I'm going to talk about today, uh, um, the main topic is deinstitutionalization. I'll describe what it is, some of the factors that led to it, uh, what we can learn from it, and particularly uh, I'm going to focus today on deinstitutionalization in the U.S. Uh, I'm going to focus um, the kind of second part of my talk on particularly litigation efforts, um, as was mentioned earlier, that I hope will connect to some litigation efforts that are happening right now in Nova Scotia. And then I'll end with some pitfalls of this tactic of litigation or class action lawsuits. First, I wanted to mention um, on, on the slide, it's an image of um, my first book, which was an anthology with uh, Chris Chapman and Alison Carey called Disability Incarcerated. And in that book and in uh, all the work that some of us are doing um, that tries to connect disability to carcerality, what we try to do is to broaden what gets to be defined as incarceration. And in our case today, also decarceration. Because incarceration happens not just in spaces that we call prisons or jails, but it's something that also happens in nursing homes, institutions for people with intellectual or developmental disabilities or psychiatric disabilities, nursing homes, and so on. So one of the things that's important to understand is that there are several conduits leading to confinement. One of them is, of course, criminalization, and the other one is medicalization. And they both entail surveillance and policing. And this is really important because it helps uh, understand that mental health and disability justice uh, um, organizing and scholarship are also carceral issues. On the slide is the image of the book I'm going to talk about uh, today, which is called Decarcerating Disability, the Institutionalization and Prison Abolition. It's really important uh, before I start talking to uh, about, about this more um, in depth to understand that when I say that institutionalization in disability institutions for people with intellectual disabilities and psychiatric confinement is carceral or incarceration, I don't mean to say that it's the same as prison, but I do mean that they are literally both carceral. I don't mean that metaphorically. Um, I mean that very, very um, uh, literally. They are both carceral, but this is, does not mean that they are the same thing. What I'm trying to do through the book, through connecting prison abolition and, uh, and you know, prison um, rights litigation, anti-prison activism, um, critical prison studies, and deinstitutionalization, anti-psychiatry, disability studies, disability justice, by trying to connect those things, it's not about to say that they are the same, but it's about saying that we need to understand the connection between various sites of incarceration, not through analogies, not through these kind of oppression Olympics, but to understand that they are connected. And also, if the network of incarceration is connected, then the means for liberation must connect as well. And this is what led me to connect the institutionalization and disability justice and disability studies, med studies, to prison abolition. And this is because, um, you know, those of us who uh, are kind of knee, de knee de deep, <laughs> I should say, into uh, prison abolition, um, probably know this, that whenever we kind of talk about this um, or uh, mention it, one of the things that uh, people often say is, well, um, you know, critiques of prisons, yes, we totally get it, but surely you don't mean right now, surely you don't mean um, um, in, in the US and Canada, right? Like you mean in smaller places like Scandinavian countries or something like that. Um, and surely you don't mean in the kind of conditions um, that we have right now. 
But one of the things that's really important uh, to understand, and this is what I try to do uh, overall with, with the book, is that abolition of carceral sites um, has already happened, both in the US and in Canada, and it has happened in our lifetime. So this is not just a vision for the future. It's not something that just happens in uh, Scandinavian countries. Um, this is something that is happening, has happened um, both in the US and in Canada. But it has happened not in the prison arena. It has happened in a different carceral arena, in the arena of institutions for people with disabilities. Um, so that's why deinstitutionalization in mental uh, health and intellectual de uh, and developmental disabilities uh, is really important as a precedent. It's something that has already happened. It's a precursor to uh, understanding prison abolition. We can learn a lot uh, from the lessons of the institutionalization. And also, you know, today I'm going to talk about it, you know, based on its own merits for people who are trying to push against the, um, the confinement uh, um, of people with disabilities in institutions and close them down. So what I'm trying to do uh, in, in the book and uh, more generally, uh, why it's really important and, and, you know, it's really important for me to say, because um, some people might find the book kind of, you know, dense at parts and so on. And it, it's also very long. Uh, and the reason why is because I'm trying to develop an alternative genealogy to deinstitutionalization. And that's what I'm going to kind of talk about uh, today. So often we understand uh, deinstitutionalization, as do I, um, is, you know, something that um, is a, kind of a big uh, major policy trend, uh, policy change, uh, both in the U.S. and in Canada. I want to... Um, I want to kind of signal, I won't get too much into it today, but I want to signal that there actually were two kinds of deinstitutionalization. Um, so I try to chart in the book the genealogy of, of both, uh, of each one. But there were really two. One is in mental health. So this is the closure of psychiatric hospitals. And the other one is in the field of intellectual and developmental disabilities. They didn't happen in the same time and they didn't exactly happen because of the same um, reasons. But today I'm kind of going to conflate them both a little bit, but you can find much more specificity in the book. And this is why it's also very long because it is very specific. But in general, at least in the US, uh, the institutionalization of people um, in the mental health field um, really started to, um, the population in psych hospital really started to decrease in the 19, towards the end of the 1950s. Um, so beginning of the 60s and so on. But in the field of intellectual disabilities, this was much later, um, 10, 15 years later, that we started to see this kind of um, large, um, uh, either closure or decrease in populations in institutions. So what is the institutionalization? Well, many people understand it uh, as the transition of people with psychiatric and intellectual disabilities or other disabilities from state institutions and uh, hospitals into community living, which is really important. It also means the closure of these facilities, these institutions, these hospitals. But what I add to the definition of deinstitutionalization is that it's um, not just a process, but it's uh, a process of kind of exodus of, of, uh, from institutionalization um, to uh, uh, deinstitutionalization, but it's a logic. Deinstitutionalization is a logic. It's a framework. It's a movement, and it's a logic that counters carceral logics. It's an anti-carceral measure. And so, I want to focus today, particularly on the part of deinstitutionalization that was more abolitionary, and the kind of tension between reform and abolition. But first, I wanted to talk a little bit about how deinstitutionalization happened through that tension of reform versus abolition. There were many factors that led to uh, deinstitutionalization in the US. Uh, one is certainly, um, I should note at the beginning, I'm going to do this very, very, very briefly. Um, there's, again, much more. Um, details uh, in the book for people who are interested. I'm also 
very happy to talk about any of this in much more detail in the Q&A. But very briefly, in the US, several factors led to um, deinstitutionalization. Uh, I don't believe that any of these factors is the factor that led to deinstitutionalization. I think it was all of them. Um, but I also think that, um, again, there's, there were factions of deinstitutionalization that were abolitionary and some that, that were not. But in general, there were federal programs and policies that just didn't exist. Um, and so once they um, came into existence, they pushed for um, deinstitutionalization or community living for people with disabilities in ways that weren't possible before. So an example in the US is Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, Medicare and Medicaid, um, you know, people sometimes think they've always, always been here, but, you know, they really started in 1965. And that helped to decrease the reliance on long-term institutionalization, uh, particularly in the psychiatric uh, arena. But it also created this institutional bias in policy that still uh, continues today. Um, and we can talk about whether or not that exists in Canada as well. But in the US, uh, the institutional bias is particularly, um, you know, there's um, Medicaid, uh, uh, what are called like home waivers. But this um, because Medicaid is federal and the way that it's being used is every state in the US um, can decide how to use uh, kind of the Medicaid money. They don't have to use the, the waivers, um, but every state has a budget for institutionalization, basically. So there's an institutional bias that actually comes as a legacy of these programming. Um, and so there's a lot of uh, disability advocacy around um, what is called um, legislation that's called um, money follows the person. Basically, that money would come to the people um, themselves, the people who have a disability, and then they can direct um, their care. The, because right now the money goes to the institution. Um, so there is this institutional bias, but I did wanted to mention that without those programs, um, we wouldn't have um, this um, process of deinstitutionalization. The second thing, uh, which I talk much more about in the book, but particularly in the arena of psychiatric deinstitutionalization, meaning the closure of psychiatric hospitals, a lot of people assume that because of the advent of psychotropic medication, like Thorazine, for example, that's what led to the ability to really um, release psychiatric patients, close down some psychiatric hospitals, um, decrease the reliance psychiatric hospitalization, that it was basically drugs that did that. And um, without the... Um, advent of these drugs without kind of discovering these drugs, we wouldn't have been able to do that. Um, that story is um, very problematic and simplistic. And most of what I just said is also not true. Like it literally didn't happen um, like that. And so just as an example, for example, is the, the story of Thorazine, which is a drug that really was used very, very substantially in um, psychiatric hospitals, but also institutions for people with intellectual disabilities. And we don't hear, um, you know, the reason why this is so fascinating to me is because, um, and this is why I call it an alternative genealogy of the institutionalization, is because we don't hear the same claims of why did so many um, institutions for people with intellectual disabilities close down? Oh, it's because of Thorazine. That's not what usually people say. Um, but in fact, at least in the U.S., it was used very, very widely in, in, um, in these kind of institutions. But it's not really part of the origin story of the institutionalization in intellectual disability in the same way that it is um, in, in psychiatric hospitalization. And why is that? One of the reasons um, why I think that is, is because the story of you know of the discovery of thorazine, uh, which wasn't really discovered at that time, it was just used 
at that time in psychiatric hospitals. And it was actually used, quite frankly, um, to um, more effectively institutionalize people, not deinstitutionalize people. Uh, but the, um, the reason why I think it really took up is this kind of uh, origin story of deinstitutionalization in psychiatric hospitals, why we were able to decrease the reliance on psychiatric hospitalization is because this is the time uh, orthorazine is one of the kind of origin stories of biopsychiatry, what would become biopsychiatry. Um, and, you know, psychiatry wasn't always only biological. Um, so we have here the convergence of um, kind of psychiatric diff um, mental difference as a psychiatric disorder. And that happened really with drugs like um, Thorazine, for example, and then later on uh, other drugs as well, Prozac and so on. And so um, people kind of look at these um, stories, um, as these narratives to say, oh, of course it cured or some way decreased uh, mental illness. This is why we're able to uh, people were able to be released from psychiatric hospitals. But of course, it didn't kind of cure um, that. And it's really important, I think, for a lot of us who are disability uh, activists and scholars to um, say that disability uh, and the whole category of mental illness, intellectual disability, and so on, are socially constructed. Um, they're not inherent in peoples, in bodies. They change over time. They change over cultures and so on. And this is a moment that really uh, connected uh, biopsychiatry and really kind of um, uh, um, made uh, mental illness as the epitome of what, um, of what psychiatry does. And so this is just long form to say um, the story of psychopharmaceuticals kind of releasing patients because they were cured and all that um, is a really simplistic version of the kind of coercion that what um, some psychiatric survivor called chemical incarceration um, and the hold that it has on people to this day. Some of the other factors leading to deinstitutionalization. Um, and you'll note, kind of a spoiler alert, that I'm telling you the factors and critiquing them at the same time, uh, because like I said, uh, it's really important to understand the simplification um, the, that has been made of these uh, reasons for deinstitutionalization, for reasons that um, I'll discuss in a little bit. Uh, so another factor uh, leading to deinstitutionalization in the US is of course, um, um, what we come to call neoliberalism, which really started around this time, uh, particularly um, in the arena um, of uh, intellectual disability, this time meaning um, early 70s, uh, at least in the US, when neoliberalism was kind of, kind of imported in, um, from the UK, from Thatcher, it was imported in the US by Reagan. So at least in the US, we started to see it. Um, certainly, um, it was more pronounced in the 80s, it was kind of imported um, in the 70s. And so we're starting to see these austerity measures and cutback uh, in human welfare. Cuts in social services, while at the same time, and this is really important to say, the spending was increased on corrections and punishment, meaning that this idea of, um, oh, we don't have enough in our budget um, is is really about priorities. It's not uh, accurate in terms of economic uh, terms. Um, you, it's not in the budget because it's not a priority, but the money um, is still there. It still went to, to things like the military industrial complex, it still uh, started to go more towards uh, corrections and punishment. And so we're starting to see, um, you know, uh, if you have kind of a graph, we're starting to see this uh, uphill in terms of uh, spending on corrections and downhill in terms of spending on actual human needs, things like housing, for example, education, um, actual, you know, welfare, um, and so on. And in addition, we're starting to seeing that the minuscule amounts that are now um, are spending about uh, around uh, mental health 
are uh, mostly uh, and today only for uh, what we come to call biopsychiatry. Um, there was supposed to be a lot of investment in community mental health, in peer support um, that has never come to fruition in the US. Um, but the really interesting you know, thing about this, I mean, of course, this uh, led to deinstitutionalization, but to me, that's not the major component that led to deinstitutionalization because I'm, um, one of the things that I'm trying to push is this idea that deinstitutionalization was also a change in how we uh, think about disability and how we think about um, uh, difference uh, and so on. And certainly these austerity measures weren't a part of that. Uh, you know, to say it very bluntly, you know, when Reagan, as governor of California, said that he's going to close down all the psychiatric um, hospitals, uh, which he ended up not closing all, but he closed a lot, uh, many of them. And then later he did the same, of course, as president. Um, he didn't do it because he cared that people were incarcerated in these places. Uh, he didn't do it because he was going to put money into community mental health, which he never did. Um, and he didn't do it because, honestly, he cared about people with disabilities. Um, he did it because of um, this neoliberal policy that he was uh, developing and ushering and because of this kind of cost profit um, measure. But, um, you know, that still led to the closure of, of psychiatric hospitals. But I I want to be very careful by saying that this is not the kind of deinstitutionalization that I was talking about earlier. So I want to uh, now focus a little bit about um, the uh, fourth kind of measure uh, or factor that led to uh, uh, deinstitutionalization in the U.S., and this is institutional reform litigation. And so, which I'll focus for um, most the rest of my talk. So institutional reform litigation is any uh, legal actions uh, in the form of lawsuits that sought to uh, reform or improve conditions of public facilities or to dis desegregate them, especially on the basis of race or disability. So this comes from a history of desegregation, uh, institutional reform litigation. Uh, it started in the US with Brown v. Board of Education. So it started with uh, really uh, racial desegregation, um, uh, class action lawsuits, and then moved into other uh, arenas, especially the disability arena. It was most pervasive in the mid 60s and 1970s in the US, which was the era of disability rights following civil rights, it was an era of anti-psychiatry, what is called the principle of normalization in intellectual and developmental disability. Uh, principle of normalization, meaning that, um, to put it very um, uh, simplistically, that people should li live as much, uh, live, grow up, be educated with, um, reside with, uh, with their peers as much as possible. Basically, that's what it means. And this was a new kind of uh, formulation that came from uh, particularly education scholars in the field of intellectual disabilities. So these uh, class action lawsuits or legal actions, um, what I want to ask for the rest of our time is, were these class action lawsuits effective? And for whom? For what? Uh, and were they affective with an A, right? Like what did they do also in terms of uh, illicit uh, emotions uh, in people, illicit actions in people? What did they do to the plaintiffs, um, to incarcerated people? What did they do to the rationale of confinement? And what did they do to the net of incarceration? And I'll try to answer um, these questions. So some of the famous ones, at least in the US, um, in terms of class action lawsuits were uh, Wyatt, uh, the Wyatt lawsuit, um, which was really about the right to treatment. And this was a very famous uh, case in which the judge said uh, the words, uh, without habilitation, a hospital is transformed into a penitentiary meaning um, people with disabilities who are confined to institutions 
at the very least should have the right to habilitation, the right to treatment. Um, Wyatt created uh, kind of a um, uh, ruffling effect um, in which afterwards a lot of lawsuits um, were made um, through the precedence uh, and policy was made through the precedent of that lawsuit. The second one, which was very um, famous and had a lot of uh, kind of uh, resonant effect was the Willowbrook case. Uh, Willowbrook was an uh, institution for people with intellectual disabilities. Um, at some point, it was um, one of the biggest institutions uh, in the world. One of the things that happened through that case is that the judge um, said that um, people uh, don't have the right to habilitation. They only have a right to protection from harm. So they basically have um, the same rights as prisoners, the right to protection from harm. The way that um, the lawyers in the Willowbrook case um, litigated it uh, was really interesting because these were all kind of activist lawyers in all this institutional reform litigation. These were um, kind of taken by um, uh, firms or people that were uh, activist um, lawyers. And um, what they did is that in in the series of lawsuits, uh, Wyatt, Willowbrook, and so on, is that they uh, mandated institutions to increase their quality of care. And the idea was to make the institutions more expensive. I mean, they knew or hoped that they won't be able to maintain the institution with that level of care. But they wanted to show that, in fact, the only quality care that people with disabilities could obtain is outside the institution. It's in the community. So it was, you know, the beginning of what, you know, I call uh, abolitionary litigation. So what they really wanted to do is close down these institutions uh, in some ways. Because many of the institutions were already pretty dilapidated at the time, um, that these lawsuits came uh, on, the what they wanted to, again, uh, gain is that this would be too costly to maintain and, in fact, would be closed down. A very interesting um, strategy. But it was really not until the Penhurst lawsuit that we uh, see not just... Um, a lawsuit about the conditions of confinement, but really a lawsuit against an institution for being an institution. So in um, Penhurst, um, the really the carceral logic or the institutional logic itself was placed on trial. It was really a case against the merits, not just the conditions of disability-based confinement. They brought in a lot of uh, experts um, you know, to talk about how people become worse in an institution, to talk about how people with disabilities, regardless of severity of disability, can live in the community. They showed cases where people do live in the community and you know, the, the gains of that, uh, particularly people with intellectual disabilities, which is what Penhurst um, mostly um, incarcerated people with intellectual disability. And so the whole issue of why do people with disabilities need to be institutionalized at all really was placed uh, on trial. Um, and it, it really was kind of the, the, the perfect storm, if you will, of lawsuit. Like it happened in a perfect timing. Um, the the uh, lawyers who litigated it, um, so on and so on. So this is... Um, really what we might call a abolition type of litigation. It wasn't about reforming the institution. It was about how can we use a class action lawsuit to uh, really shut down this institution and in essence, all institutions like it, to really use it as a precedent to do that. Um, but let's see what happened. Um, so this was, I just wanna say all these lawsuits, I forgot to put, um, I'm so sorry, I forgot to put, um, years on them. This was in the heyday of institutional reform litigation. So these lawsuits were mostly um, 60s, 70s, uh, and so on, when they started to be litigated, um, mostly in the 70s, um, a little bit in the early 80s. But 
we, um, after the passage of um, the Americans with Disabilities Act, which passed in 1990, we're starting to see a surge of new kind of institutional reform litigation. So institutional reform litigation didn't kind of die in the, in the 70s, it just kind of transformed. And the way that it transformed, um, David Furliger, who is one of the um, kind of prominent activist lawyers that was very involved in the Pennhurst lawsuit, for example, he says that uh, legal efforts for the mentally disabled first emphasized commitment procedures, how you get in. Gradually, it emphasized uh, the right to treatment, um, what happens once you are in. And the newest inquiry, he says, is whether there is justification for institutionalization, whether anyone should be in at all, which is what Penhurst uh, kind of was. After um, the passage of the ADA, what we're starting to see is an anti-discrimination argument that's added. So it's not just um, uh, challenging uh, loss of liberty and needing to justify confinement, but it becomes an anti-discrimination argument, meaning people are discriminated, people with disabilities are discriminated against because they are confined while other people um, who are non-disabled uh, are not. So if litigation from the 60s to the 80s or early 90s was about improving living conditions, um, or in some cases, closing down particular facilities, the strategies uh, after, uh, 19, uh, after um, ADA, and especially after the Olmsted decision in 1999, the strategy is to increase community-based living. So the fight right now is not so much about the institution and its conditions, although there's a lot of litigation about that as well, for sure. But it's really about what comes after, what comes instead of the institution. So let's take stock of this. Remember, I asked you at the beginning, so was this effective with an E? Was it effective with an A? Um, what was the role of, of these lawsuits that really acted as kind of uh, exposés? for people. Um, a lot of these lawsuits, especially the early ones, um, but, but even contemporary uh, lawsuits, uh, a lot of the kind of big ones really act as a shock and awe campaigns. Um, what they have done is that they um, really have this com uh, cumulative effect, um, meaning that it really brought to the public imagination, the horrific conditions of institutions. What I mean by this is that, you know, most people don't necessarily know what's going on in inside of psychiatric hospitals, institutions for people with intellectual disabilities, um, nursing homes, um, prisons. And this is because we can't know because we can't go into these places because we're not supposed to know. But lawsuits act as exposés in the way that they um, kind of uh, bring that attention outside of these uh, spaces of carcerality and confinement. And they really politicize people, both people on the outside that were really horrified by these early um, lawsuits and exposés um, and uh, um, the fact that institutionalization still persists. So people are horrified. It politicizes people on the outside. It also politicizes people on the inside. So in terms of the Penhurst case, the Willowbro case, they became kind of um, um, uh, groups of people. Uh, it really brought people together, especially in terms of self-advocacy. So the seeds of self-advocacy in, in um, uh, intellectual disability movement um, came through processes like these lawsuits whether or not they were successful. But that's how a lot of people kind of came together. It also, um, one of the other things that it did, or the main thing that it did, is that it brought through reforms that really resulted in changes in these facilities. Um, more buildings, more staff, more funding. But unfortunately, it brought in more buildings, more staff, and more funding, meaning these institutions lingered on because of these lawsuits, that some of these lawsuits sought to close them down 
they did in some degree the opposite, um, unfortunately. So Willowbrook closed down, Penhurst closed down, but they closed down you know, 30 years, um, 40 years after the initial lawsuit was brought on. This is decades later, decades. Um, and by that point, there was hardly anybody, you know, in there. Um, and this is not to say, you know, the, the people that remained there, uh, you know, should have stayed or something like that. But this is to say um, what has uh, often happened is that it was litigated for decades, resulted in really watered down kind of consent decrees that were not adhered to, went back to the court, went back to the court, went back to the court and so on. This is what uh, prison abolitionist activist Rachel Herzig calls tweaking Armageddon. This is this kind of reform. Let's do a little bit more of this. Let's do a little bit more of that. But in essence, you're really tweaking catastrophe. Um, what this reform did is that it critiqued conditions of confinement, but not really the rationale of confinement. Questioning how service, you know, whether or not services are effective doesn't necessarily lead to eroding the legitimacy of caging people. And the other thing that's really important is that some of these, even if they ended up in the closure of particular facility, it wasn't necessarily abolitionary because some people end up in a different facility. So closure of facility, even though it's incredibly important, it's necessary, but it's not a sufficient action on the road to abolition. So I want to, you know, kind of move towards um, the analysis that would lead us to the conclusion here. Um, and this is the difference between kind of reform and abolition or the, the, the pendulum, not really a difference because they're very connected, but the pendulum between reform and abolition. This comes from um, the politics of abolition, a, a 1974 book by Tom, uh, Thomas Mathieson, uh, M-A-T-H. I-E-S-E-N. And he followed um, Andre Gorz's um, G-O-R-Z um, definition between reformist and non-reformist reforms. It's a mouthful. Um, reformist and non-reformist reforms that were later popularized. Uh, you might have heard it from activists like um, and scholars like Ruthie Wilson Gilmore. Reformist reforms are situated in the status quo, meaning that the changes are made within an existing system or framework. Non-reformist reforms really imagine a different horizon. They're not really limited to what is possible at present. So it's not about, oh, let's bring more staff, um, let's bring more budget. It's about imagining community living through something like litigation, for example. So that's the difference between reformist and non-reformist reforms. And we can ask ourselves whether or not um, litigation was uh, reformist or non-reformist. In some cases, it's both. So what are some of the lessons now, you know, kind of bringing us to more conclusion? What then led to deinstitutionalization um, as abolition? I talked about um, uh, psychiatric medication. I talked about um, austerity measures or neoliberalism, basically you know, cutting budgets and closing down things without putting anything in their place. I talked about um, Medicare and other policies um, that arose. I talked about litigation. What then led to deinstitutionalization as abolition? Well, um, in addition to everything that I mentioned at the beginning, including litigation, um, one, what I think really led to deinstitutionalization as abolition was none of those things I mentioned earlier, or only a little bit of those things I mentioned earlier. Those things really helped in the closure of the facilities. But closure is not enough. What we really need is a change in social attitudes towards disability and mental health. And you start to see that in the litigation aspect as well. Once kind of experts, including disabled people, were put 
uh, on the stand to talk about why nobody should be in an institution because of their disability or otherwise. We're, st we're seeing um, the uh, influence of anti-psychiatry movement, of consumer survivor ex-patient movement, of self-advocacy movement, which by the way, at least in the US, and um, it's not just in the US, it's also in Canada, um, actually. Um, and uh, Melanie Panich talks about it in her work, uh, Panich, P-A-N-I-T-C-H. Um, the self-advocacy movement, um, the movement of people with intellectual and developmental disability, they called for closing down all residential institutions for people with disabilities which they called very earlier on as a form of incarceration. So once the self-advocacy movement, you know, really began um, to, to take hold, they were very um, clear and very early, you kind of early on clear that it's not just this institution or that institutions, but um, they, they talked about how in, like in their words, um, we need to get our friends out. <laughs> um, we need to uh, close down those, you know, despicable places and so on. And so they talked about it again. Uh, they didn't use the word abolition, but basically that's what they demanded very early on, the abolition of these spaces. So that is deinstitutionalization. Is abolition. It came from social movements. This is why deinstitutionalization, it's not only abolitionary and it's not only about social movements, but this is the aspect that nobody almost ever talks about in relation to deinstitutionalization. And this is why it's radical. It's considered kind of dangerous, right? Um, and it's, uh, we tend to talk more about like the austerity measures, Thorazine, you know, all of these kind of uh, notions of why deinstitutionalization happened because we say that it failed, at least in the US. A lot of people blame deinstitutionalization for the rise of incarceration, for the rise in homelessness, all kinds of things like that. But digitalization didn't, um, a lot of things in it we, we, we can do better about for sure, but it wasn't a failure. It was a success and this is because it happened. And it's something that a lot of people for many decades, people with disabilities advocated for it to happen. And so to say that it failed, um, is in essence to kind of blame these movements for things that were much broader, like neoliberalism, blaming disability for neoliberalism. I mean, it's like, but this is the dangerous, this is the danger of this simplistic narrative of the genealogy of the industrialization. If we think the industrialization only happened because of Thorazine and Reagan and, you know, all these kind of stuff, um, then we really don't have an understanding of disability history, of the resistance of um, disabled people to their own confinement, of everything that we were able to achieve. And that's kind of thrown into our faces as something that led to the rise of uh, imprisonment, homelessness, you know, and things of that nature, when in essence, it was really the um, socioeconomic political changes that led to those two things at the same time. And so um, um, one of the things uh, I also wanted to, to mention, you know, there was also a parents movement um, and so on. I don't, I don't have really time to kind of go um, into all of this, but one of the lessons that I want us to kind of remember from deinstitutionalization is just like people in the self-advocacy movement have been saying since pretty much um, early 80s, is anybody should and can be decarcerated. So this is why deinstitutionalization as abolition is so, so, so important because we have to break down these kind of hierarchies between who can quote unquote live on the outside and who can or should not live on the outside. But in fact, one of the most success, uh, successful cases of deinstitutionalization we're not uh, Willowbrook and Penhurst, you know, and those things that took 40 years to close down an institution. But it was cases in which uh, people started from the margins. People 
started um, deinstitutionalization with what do we do with the quote unquote most kind of severe cases or severe disabilities or um, uh, in the prison abolition world, um, uh, the opposite of nonviolent, um, the opposite of uh, non-sexual offenders and so on. So what do we do when we start with the violent, the sexual offenders, the, I'm putting it all in air quotes, if you can see, um, the quote unquote severe cases. If we think about people with the most complex needs first, it's much easier then to um, release people with less complex needs. So this is true in terms of emotional needs, uh, medical needs, all of those things. And so those is, that is one of the lessons of uh, deinstitutionalization as abolition. Anybody can live on the outside with the right supports. The second lesson is that institutional um, institution and deinstitutionalization is a logic. It's not a place. So closing down an institution is really, really, really important. But it's really just step one, because otherwise people will be put in a different institution or a different kind of institution. So the abolitionary framework or deinstitutionalization as abolition Again, the way self-advocacy talks about it, no more institutions ever for anybody is really, really, really important because it's logic. It changes how we think about people. It becomes nonsensical for us to cage people for being disabled or for anything. Once that kind of shift happens, um, then we can really start talking about, okay, what is the best thing for um, each individual people? And then we start to have a conversation more about community reinvestment. What do we do with all this you know, money? Because it is very costly. Institutionalization is very costly. So can we use that to actually invest in people, in community? And so, um, you know, one of the things to really uh, remember also that um, one of the things that happened uh, in in the U.S. at least in terms of deinstitutionalization, um, I know this has happened in Canada too, uh, because um, this is mostly uh, uh, kind of women's labor. Uh, I do want to kind of point that this is a, a feminist issue. Um, by women's labor, I mean that post deinstitutionalization a lot of people with uh, particularly intellectual disabilities no longer live in institutions, which is wonderful. But that means that if they live in the community, it's usually with a family member. And that family member is usually a mother or a sibling. Um, and it's really important to kind of develop or think about communities that uh, take up this uh, approach of uh, um, the, the abolitionist mindset, but also to do it in a way that is uh, feminist. Um, lastly, I just wanted to say, what if we don't, <laughs> right? What if we uh, understand the industrialization as the closure of facilities, but not, not really as an abolitionist measure? Well, if we only understand it as uh, a measure of kind of closing down things, then we have um, um, we will we will get into what I call carceral ableism or carceral sanism. Um, sanism for people who don't know, by the way, um, just to pause. Sanism is the oppression based on particular impetuses to be rational, uh, to be sane. Uh, it's mostly the oppression of people that we call psychiatrically disabled, but really it's the oppression of all of us uh, with this impetus to, to be sane or to perform sanity. So going back, carceral ableism or carceral sanism is what I define as the praxis and believe that people with disabilities need special or extra protections 
but it happens in a way that often expands their further marginalization and incarceration. What do I mean by all this? If we understand deinstitutionalization only as something with limits, meaning only for some people, but surely people with severe quote-unquote disabilities always will need to be incarcerated, right? Surely people, not everybody can live in the community, right? Surely, you know, and so on and so on. Then that would lead to the marginalization and incarceration uh, of, um, of people because what happens is that it legitimates um, incarceration. This is not good for these people, but surely for other people, it's fine to have the institution. Deinstitutionalization is abolition, says not fine for anybody. It makes no sense. It's carceral. And so if we think about that, the kind of what people now call alternatives to incarceration, which are so infuriating, we can start addressing really as carceral sanism or carceral ableism. What are some examples? Uh, community treatment orders, right? So people, sh sure, they don't need to be in an institution, but they absolutely still need to mandatorily take their drugs and people need to see that they're taking their drugs. And so we have these community treatment orders. We have what is called chemical incarceration, um, you know, th this uh, enforcement of uh, psychiatric drug taking and so on. So all of these things people say are alternatives to incarceration, but actually are just incarceration in a different uh, form. Um, here is just a link that I will put in the chat about kind of how to tell the difference between abolition and reform or reform and non-reformist reforms. I'm happy to put that uh, in the chat. But really what I want, uh, I want us to kind of think through together is um, the pendulum, again, between reform and abolition and looking at deinstitutionalization as abolition. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leah. Um, one thing that I really wish is that we sort of, we were in a room where everybody was here uh, able to speak and share. But what I'm gonna do is go through a couple of questions that are in the Q&A. And I just wanna set it up um, very, very briefly. I mentioned this earlier and Leah, you also referred to it, but just to situate your remarks uh, in the context of Nova Scotia and where it's sitting in, in relation to deinstitutionalization litigation. So I want to just sort of frame that. Uh, and for people in the audience as well, uh, that um, an important human rights complaint uh, was uh, successful in establishing before our Court of Appeal, Nova Scotia's Court of Appeal in 2019, that Nova Scotia had systematically discriminated against people with disabilities needing social assistance really in three primary ways. So by forcing folks to live in institutions uh, in order to receive some form of uh, support. Uh, second, forcing people to move far from their home communities in order to receive that support. And third, uh, kind of the converse of institutionalization, um, just leaving people languishing on wait lists and getting no support at all. So those things sort of tied together were recognized as systemic discrimination against people with disabilities in Nova Scotia. So where we're sitting right now, and I'm saying this to frame the first question that I see here on the list, uh, we're um, in a process as a province of considering what remedies would answer, would, would speak to those harms. And so that's where your talk has in, in many ways led me um, to you know, think in light of the precedents that you've that you've so helpfully um, put forward, some of the pitfalls there, but also the, the incremental kind of the, the progress and the new strategies and the new unpacking of logics and so on. Um, and so a, a big question that you've put on the table for us is what it might mean to responsively, you know, responsive to the kind of anti-carceral logics, let's say, that you've identified as at the heart of the most potent 
litigation? How, how might a remedy look? So here's the first question that I see. It's from Vince Calderhead, who's um, one of the lawyers that worked on the Disability Rights Coalition case. He worked for the individual complainants. Uh, and the question is, what happened to the ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, discrimination litigation approach. So you sort of built up to that one that was challenging the logic of institutionalization itself as discriminatory. He says, under that paradigm, anti-discrimination, how can or could institutions continue as you have suggested they have? Yeah, thanks. Um, thank you, Vince, for the question and thank you for your work. Really, 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 um, um, you know, Sheila kind of filled me in. Very, very important uh, lawsuit. Uh, I'm assuming this is a rhetorical question because, um, yes, how? Um, but more um, substantially, <clears throat> I kind of glossed over it, but really um, the big one in the U.S. was Olmstead. You know, and Olmstead uh, was uh, filed in 1999, and it's a lawsuit um, that was brought by um, to uh, through, I should say, two plaintiffs. Um, one, uh, and the reason why I'm mentioning it, because one of the plaintiffs, L Lois Curtis, um, L-O-I-S, uh, Curtis is C-U-R-T-I-S. She um, died, uh, I think, last month um, or two months ago. And, um, you know, her, her death is very, very messed. She was very big in um, disability rights uh, and especially self-advocacy. Uh, in the, in the U.S., so I just want to kind of take a moment to you know thank her. Uh, we really wouldn't have Olmstead, you know, without her and without the people who brought on that lawsuit. And so what that lawsuit did is, on behalf of um, of Lois and another plaintiff, they um, uh, reasoned that um, on the basis of anti discrimination that both of those plaintiffs um, didn't need to be in an institution because they were already um, uh, e even medically, right? Even the, the doctor said they don't need to be in an institution, but there was no community placements for them to be. And so that was Olmstead. And so today in the US, uh, I don't want to give a, a numerical answer because I'm not sure, but I want to venture to say that in almost any, maybe not all, but in almost all um, states in the U.S., there's some kind of an Olmstead lawsuit happening, like right now, which is based on the same premise, meaning uh, with the precedent of Olmstead, and they're literally called Olmstead lawsuits, meaning that uh, people are in institutions because they um, because they don't live in the communities because of this institutional bias that I mentioned at the beginning of my talk. The money doesn't go towards that. The money from the government goes towards institutionalizing people. And so the lawsuit is based on that, is that people, even that medically, people say don't need to be in an institution uh, are placed there. And that's where the anti-discrimination kind of comes, comes through. Um, if you're asking why it's not working, um, <laughs> you know, it's because the U.S. is a uh, capitalist, um, settler, heteropatriarchal, ableist um, institution, and it doesn't really care about these things. Uh, but secondly, um, which I think is related to the other question here, um, particularly nursing homes and um, those kind of institutions in the US, they're almost all always for profit. And so, you know, the profit impetus here is like, it's huge. Um, so in addition to the to the bias in the actual policy, which is Medicare and Medicaid, the way allocation is disability assistance, right, allocation of money, uh, governmental assistance is done. In addition to that, there's, of course, the bias of uh, what uh, Martha Russell called uh, handy capitalism, you know, how disability is spun into gold. And this is through institutionalization. Uh, a lot of the time. So this is a major, major like industry, at least in the US. Thanks, Leah. Um, and again, I really encourage people to, to pick up your book uh, where you develop this idea of, you know, the 
sort of corporate uh, and profit seeking element of perpetuation of, of institutionalization in different forms, as well as you know other other factors um, perpetuating it. So that's that's a neat um, start on that. So the, there is another question I see from Ellison, which I think you've started. You were your answer was um, speaking to in part. So Ellison was bringing out. Um, some cost arguments, which kind of goes back to your, your neoliberal point and the point that sometimes you can find, let's call it strange bedfellows in arguing for deinstitutionalization um, based on economic arguments. So Ellison says the cost of incarceration in Nova Scotia provincial jail was 14.8 times higher uh, and says uh, below 2021 numbers than what would have been provided to an eligible income assistance recipient with a disability. So 950 bucks a month for income assistance, 14,100 uh, uh, per month to incarcerate an adult. So I haven't gone and checked precisely those numbers, but Ellison, let's take, this is absolutely such a, such a key point. The investment is so high when the person is in that uh, prison space or in this case, jail space. He says, do you believe litigation against the province for their lack of support to folks with disability could be successful? And here, Ellison, I take your question to go beyond the deinstitutionalization work of shutting institutions and shifting to community. It's kind of the sort of what does that mean in terms of social assistance being in some sense, uh, yeah, um, adequate. Leah, you could reflect on that in light of your the precedents you're familiar with in terms of litigation, since that was the question, or you know anything broader around social movements as well. Yeah, I think um, I'm not sure that like litigation would be the way to to kind of counter the the economic aspect of this. To be quite honest, um, but I but there is a lot of disability rights activism, you know, around it, um, mostly through kind of legislation and shifting policy, because this comes from policy, right? Um, so the numbers that you've given are, at least in, you know, Illinois, for example, where I'm at, if you were to kind of insert those numbers, not just for prisons and jails, but um, in large institutions, large meaning uh, 15 or, uh, I'm sorry, 16, I don't know why, 16 or over uh, in the US is large. Um, so it's the same thing, meaning um, exponentially more costs more to incarcerate somebody in an institution than it is to provide um, somebody with finances to um, hire a home health aid or personal assistance um, and basically support somebody for independent living at home. Um, it's exponentially more cost to incarcerate. Um, so, you know, the question of, of why, again, has a lot to do with the um, what we come to call the prison industrial complex, the institution industrial complex, and so on. And it's not really something that necessarily litigation, I think, is going to, to help because I'm not sure if it was clear, or maybe I tried to bury it, but abolition, um, at least prison abolition, is an anti-capitalist um, and anti-racist and anti-colonial um, framework. Um, so you can, it's not just like a pro-disability thing. It's really, we have to change everything. Uh, and this is, you know, Ruthie Wilson Gilmore, who's a prominent prison abolitionist. Um, she has a book coming out. It's literally called Change Everything <laughs> because people often ask her, well, what do we need to change in order to, you know, uh, abolish prisons? And literally <laughs> it's everything. So it is an anti-capitalist, um, you know, anti-racist, anti-colonial framework. Um, and so it can't be built on top of the world um, or the systems that we have now. It's imagining uh, a world in which we relate differently to each other, in which we don't put profit over people, in which we care about, you know, the land and environment and, and you know, all of those things. And those things are connected also within our struggles. Liet, uh, and folks in the audience, I, I really wish that we could go on and have a much longer conversation. It's um, now 20 after, which is the time when we have on our poster that we end. I'm just going to take a, a moment more to say um, just a couple of things. And one responds to what I see as Ellison 
um, adding to that question. So I would, I would have loved, in fact, I'd love to have a whole other section with you, Leah, speaking more about um, uh, remedies and what it would mean to achieve transformative remedies, reaching to the kinds of structural constraints that you just mentioned. And that is the, the struggle <clears throat> for many of those, not just here, but everywhere involved in trying to articulate what the different what a different system would look like and so you had mentioned person directed funding or money follows the person not the institution so Ellison it's back to your your questions about how the money could be redistributed uh, and that is one of the the burning questions I think for us is how one can um, operationalize and structure such a system uh, without falling prey to the neoliberal, you know, kinds of um, uh, cost savings uh, logics, which include downloading administration to individuals, you know, the drying up of supports and so on. So I just wanted to say that as, a, as another follow up to this really important question of, you know, where the money is going, institutions or something else. Um, I'm going to um, close it up with, uh, First of all, just our gratitude, Liet, to you for coming and sharing um, this wonderful work and thinking on uh, dismantling sort of a conventional thinking about deinstitutionalization and its possibilities um, with us. Uh, and I do encourage, I'll say it again, everybody uh, who's here to engage really closely with Liet's work um, over the last decade and more on uh, this really um, live this live uh, and burning issue for us in Nova Scotia both in the prison context and thank you Alison for those questions and I'm sorry to others who we weren't able to get to and in the um, disability institutionalization context. I want to just say that next up in the health law seminar series is Joanna Erdman who is McBain chair in health law and policy here at Dal uh, Friday February the 10th same time uh, but this will be in person as well as online webinar her seminar will be abortion rights after the fall of Roe v. Wade. And I encourage you so strongly to come out to that one as well. Um, join me at least in theory, I can hear the applause in some <laughs> version of the world uh, in thanking Leah once again. So thank you, Leah. Thanks for having me. Absolutely.